Who is the servant of the Lord? Well, there's more than... It, there's more than one servant of the Lord. Now, Daniel didn't ask in his question, he didn't specifically mention the word servant, but that's what it deals with, right? And that's where the debate is, who's the servant of the Lord? Sometimes Israel very much is the servant of the Lord, but Israel's not the only servant of the Lord, okay? So if we'll go to uh, Isaiah 41, 8, and I'm going to read a lot today, be, be, and, and some of the themes are going to be kind of repeated, and I might even hit... Uh, a passage more than once, but but it's going to kind of help us build up a crescendo. The climax is going to be understanding Isaiah 53, I think, okay? Because that's where it really gets heated up, right? Uh, Messianic Jews and Christians say Isaiah 53 is clearly the Messiah. Uh, Non-Messianic Jews say it's clearly Israel, and I think if we build up that crescendo, we're going to see there's really not that much to debate here. Um, if, if we put aside our polemics, if we put aside the desire for our particular theology to win, um, and we just read the Bible, I think the context is going to make it pretty clear. Okay, but first, okay, Israel is the servant of, Israel is a servant of the Lord, okay? So Isaiah 41, verses 8 through 10, clearly talking about Israel. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend, you whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corners, saying to you, you are my servant, I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Okay. By the way, I'm reading from the English Standard Version of the Bible, okay, which is, is a translation I really like. I also like the Tree of Life Version of the Bible. The problem with the Tree of Life Version is they don't have a version of their Bible out yet with wide margins where I can take notes. And so, um, so uh, but it is a Christian version of the Bible uh, I'm not sure in this case if it might be a verse or two off here and there. I know earlier in Isaiah that happens. It may happen here. So if you have a Jewish version or a Messianic Jewish version, and I say verse 8, and it's actually verse 7, just, just look a, a verse ahead or, or below, okay? Anyway, we see clearly there that Israel is a, is a servant of the Lord, okay? Uh, 43.10, we see the same thing. You are my witnesses, declares the Lord, and my servant whom I have chosen, that you may know and believe me and understand that I am he. Before me no God was formed, nor shall there be any after me. Lord, just guide us through this in Yeshua's name. So here we have uh, Israel is a witness, and Israel is God's servant. And those two overlap. What is the nature of Israel's servanthood? It's that Israel is a witness. Isaiah 44, verses 1 through 5. But now hear, O Jacob, my servant. There it says it again, right? Jacob, of course, is another name for Israel because the father of the nation of Israel is Jacob. And Jacob's other name is Israel. His name was changed to Israel, okay? So, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen, Thus says the Lord who made you and formed you from the womb. I actually don't need to read uh, the rest right now. The main point here is it's mentioning Jacob slash Israel as God's servant. Okay? So, so th that's clear. The problem is, is that some people will read those portions about Israel being God's servant and assume that the servant is always Israel, and the reason I know they do that is because I've had many discussions with Jewish people and non-Jewish people who have rejected Yeshua. I've had discussions with them, and they say, see, Israel is God's servant, and so when Isaiah 53 says servant, it's got to be talking about Israel. And, and it's just not the case. Right? The servant is not always Israel. The servant's not always the Messiah either. 
Sometimes it's Israel. Sometimes it's once it's it's Cyrus. Sometimes it's um, uh, uh, the prophet, right? So ser servant applies to different uh, characters throughout the book. Okay. Now this is difficult to discuss, but it's here. Israel is the failed servant of the Lord. Doesn't mean God's done with Israel. It doesn't mean Israel doesn't still have a part to play in God's plan. They very much do. But the part that Israel plays in God's plan is not, look at me how righteous I am, but something else that we'll get to later. But first, just some verses to clarify Israel as the servant of the Lord in Isaiah's day is the failed servant. Isaiah 42, verses 18 through 25. Hear you deaf and look you blind that you may see. Who is blind but my servant? Or deaf as my messenger whom I send? Who is blind as my dedicated one or blind as the servant of the Lord? Right? It's very clear here. Okay? Israel is blind and deaf as uh, in her role as servant of the Lord. He sees many things, but does, does not observe them. His ears are open, but he does not hear. The Lord was pleased for his righteousness sake to magnify his law, his Torah, and make it glorious. But this is a people plundered and looted. They are all of them trapped in holes and hidden in prisons. They have become plunder with none to rescue, spoil with none to say restore. Who among you will give ear to this, will attend and listen for the time to come? Who gave up Jacob to the looter and Israel to the plunderers? Was it not the Lord against whom you have sinned, in whose ways they would not walk, in whose law they would not obey? So he poured on them the heat of his anger and the might of battle. It set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. Okay, it's pretty clear there. Israel's uh, failed in her role. 43 verses 22 through 28. You did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense, yet you have not bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will remember your sin. I, I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let, let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned, and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob to utter destruction and Israel to reviling. Israel's going to be punished for failing to uh, follow the Lord. Okay. 49 verses 18 and 19. Lift up your eyes around and see. They all gather. They come to you. As I live, declares the Lord, you shall put them all on uh, as an ornament. You shall bind them on as a bride does, surely your waste and your desolate places and your devastated land, surely now you will be, okay, I, I, I made a mistake here, 49, 18, and 19. Okay, I don't know what I meant there. This, this is not what I meant to read here, but it doesn't matter. We've got enough other verses here to, to, to show our point. So let's go to 51, 17. <clears throat> Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk, drunk to the dregs the bowl, the, cat, uh, the cup of staggering. Okay? So, so Israel's being punished. Israel is going to endure difficult times because she has failed, she has not lived up to her calling. Okay? So just to reiterate, point one, Israel is a servant of the Lord, absolutely. 
but Israel is a, a failed servant of the Lord. The Lord also says beautiful things about Israel, his love for Israel, the future of Israel, but in the context of the book and these chapters, it's not that Israel has gained her reward, but it's that is, Israel will receive favor, uh, unmerited favor from the Lord. Okay, God is the rescuer of Israel. This is the context. As we build up to chapter 53, which I didn't include here, but could have, uh, we're going to focus on 53 later, the context is clear. We're building up to not Israel is somehow a savior, but that Israel needs saving. And even after Isaiah 53, we're going to see Israel needs saving, okay? Chapter 40, verses 9 through 11. Go up on a high mountain, O Zion, herald of good news. Lift up your voice and with strength, O Jerusalem, herald of good news. <coughs> Lift it up, fear not. Say to the cities of Judah, Behold your God. Behold, the Lord comes with might, and his arm rules for him. Behold, his reward is with him, and his recompense before him. He will tend his flock like a shepherd. He will gather the lambs in his arms. He will carry them in his bosom, and gently lead those that are with young. Israel's going to be blessed, but it's because of God as rescuer, not because of... A, uh, just the normal rewards of righteousness. is because of God as rescuer. This word here in chapter, I'm uh, sorry, verse 9, um, herald of good news, okay, uh, that's, um, that's the word from which we get gospel from, right? Euangelion, in, uh, in the, at least that's the root word. It's a little different form here. But um, that's the good news, Right? That's the good news. And good news is that you're going to receive the blessings of the Lord despite not having earned them. 41 verses 8 through 13. But you, Israel, my servant, Jacob, whom I have chosen, the offspring of Abraham, my friend. And I read this earlier, but we're going to go a little further this time. You whom I took from the ends of the earth and called from its furthest corner, saying to you, you are my servant. I have chosen you and not cast you off. Fear not, for I am with you. Be not dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my righteous right hand. Um, where, where was I? Uh, Behold, all who are incensed against you shall be put to shame and confounded. Okay, talking about the nations. Those who strive against you shall be as nothing and shall perish. You shall look you shall seek those who contend with you, but you shall not find them. Those who war against you shall be as nothing at all. For I, the Lord your God, hold your right hand. It is I who say to you, fear not, I am the one who helps. And God himself will be the deliverer of Israel. That's the theme that's being built up. God will deliver Israel. It's gonna, it's gonna, we're going to see it over and over. Chapter 41, verse 20 that they may see and know, may consider and understand together that the hand of the Lord has done this. The Holy One of Israel has created it. God's just saying, I'm going to act. I'm going to unilaterally act. My own hand is going to do it. In another verse, my own right arm will do it. The Lord is grieved. Nobody's rising up to be the rescuer or the deliverer. I myself will be the rescuer or the deliverer. It's a repeated thing. God is going to act unilaterally. Despite Israel not de deserving it, despite the nations not deserving it, I'm just going to rise up and I'm going to be the deliverer. Okay. 42, uh, starting at verse 25, going to 43, verse 1. So he poured on them the heat of his anger and the might of battle, it set him on fire all around, but he did not understand. It burned him up, but he did not take it to heart. Right, Talking about Jacob receiving the wrath of the Lord. But then we go to the next verse, and obviously the chapters and the verses were not in the original. That's a much later um, innovation. So don't necessarily see a break here between the chapters, okay? Uh, and, and quick side note, that's why we have to be careful. 
right? When, uh, when, um, and, 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 and I love some of the people that do this and their heart is good and, and I'm not saying that you shouldn't listen to anything they say, right? But when preachers get up and they say, uh, this, such and such a verse, I look at the numbers and just happens to line up, um, that, that, the numbers are not inspired, right? The numbers are just added in later on for convenience, okay? So don't see a break here uh, between 42 and 43. Many times the chapter breaks have meaning, right? The, the people that put them in saw, oh, seems like we're at a new theme here and such. But here, we need to just see this connected, okay? 42, 25, so he poured on them the heat of his anger, etc. 43, 1, but now, thus says the Lord, he who created you, O Jacob, he who formed you, O Israel, fear not, for I have redeemed you. I have called you by name, you are mine. Okay, and let's uh, go to 43, 22, through uh, 44, 3. Yet you did not call upon me, O Jacob, but you have not, not been, uh, but you have been weary of me, O Israel. You have not brought me your sheep for burnt offerings or honored me with your sacrifices. I have not burdened you with offerings or wearied you with frankincense. You have not bought me sweet cane with money or satisfied me with the fat of your sacrifices, but you have burdened me with your sins. You have wearied me with your iniquities. Could we read some of that earlier? Okay, Israel's the failed servant. In the midst of Israel being the failed servant, here's how the Lord responds. I, I am he who blots out your transgressions for my own sake, and I will not remember your sins. Put me in remembrance. Let us argue together. Set forth your case that you may be proved right. Your first father sinned and your mediators transgressed against me. Therefore, I will profane the princes of the sanctuary and deliver Jacob up to utter destruction in Israel to reviling, but now hear, O Jacob, my servant, Israel, whom I have chosen. Thus says the Lord who made you, who formed you from the womb, and will help you. Fear not, O Jacob, my servant, Jeshurun, which is a, a term of endearment for Israel that God, God uses for Israel. Jeshurun, whom I have chosen. For I will pour water on the thirsty land and streams on the dry ground. I will pour my spirit upon your offspring and my blessing on your descendants. Okay? This is the theme. Israel sins. Israel endures the punishment of the Lord. Israel gets the deliverance and the blessing of the Lord. God is setting himself up as the righteous deliverer of Israel in the midst of Israel's unrighteousness. Okay? 44, verse 22. I have blotted out your transgressions like a cloud and your sins like a mist. Return to me, for I have redeemed you. Even before they've returned, I've blotted them out. Now return to me, right? The Lord is working as a redeemer in the midst of Israel's unrighteousness. 51, 17 through 23. Wake yourself, wake yourself, stand up, O Jerusalem, you who have drunk from the hand of the Lord the cup of his wrath, who have drunk to the dregs the bowl, the cup of staggering. There's none to guide her among all the sons she has borne. There's none to take her by the hand among all the sons she has brought up. These two things have happened to you. Who will console you? Devastation and destruction, famine and sword. Who will comfort you? Your sons have fainted. They lie at the head of every street like an antelope in a net. They are full of the wrath of the Lord, the rebuke of your God. Therefore, hear this, you who are afflicted, who are drunk, but not with wine. Thus says the Lord, the Lord your God, who pleads the cause of his people. Behold, I have taken from your hand the cup of staggering. The bowl of my wrath you shall drink no more. But I will put it into the hand of your tormentors who have said to you, bow down that we may pass over. And you have made your back like the ground and like the street for them to pass over. I have punished you, right? You have drunk the cup of my wrath, but now I'm going to take it from you and give it to those who were tormenting you. Okay? 
Again, we don't see here, oh, because now you've repented and you're doing a lot of good things, I'm going to take it. It's just the Lord acting unilaterally. I'm going to be your rescuer, even though you don't deserve it. I'm going to take that cup from you, that cup of wrath, and give it to those who are tormenting you. Okay? 44 verse 5. Let me get this verse and then I'll take any... 54 verse 5? Yeah, 54 verse 5. And then I'll... Um, for your maker is your husband, the Lord of hosts is his name. The Holy One of Israel is your redeemer, right? So who's redeemer in this book? It's not Israel. Certainly not the nations. It's God is redeemer. The God of the whole earth, he is called. Emily, your hand up, was, your hand was up, darling. I'm just trying to say mercy. Mercy, exactly. Right. That's the theme here is mercy. Okay. All right. Any any. Well, let me just go back real quick, and then before we move on, I'll see if you have any questions. So, point one, Israel is the servant of the Lord. Absolutely. Israel is the servant who has failed. Who is blind as my servant, right? Who is deaf but the one I've called, and, and so forth. But in the midst of Israel being the failed servant, uh, yes, there is wrath, there is punishment, but there's going to be redemption. At some point, God's going to come into history and bring redemption. All right, any questions on those points? Okay. Now we're going to see that theme specifically applied to a different servant, one who can't possibly be Israel. All right. So let's go to 42 verses 1 through 5. And this is where I got into a, a debate online with, um, with a rabbi, who um, not, not a messianic rabbi, who says, oh, this is talking about Israel. It's not talking about Israel, right? We got into the Hebrew. He couldn't show me even from the Hebrew. Because that's, that's, that's often uh, the debate you'll get. Oh, you're, you're looking at it at the English, but we're able to read the Hebrew. Right, most American Jews cannot read Hebrew, and even even if they can read it, they they don't. And I'm not saying that out of any kind of disdain or anything like that. I'm just it's just a fact, right? Uh, religious education amongst most American Jews, unfortunately, is is quite low. They don't read their Bible uh, as much as Christians do in general. But there are some very well informed Jewish people out there some very well-informed rabbis out there who can dig into the Hebrew. Uh, and so if we don't know what we're talking about, um, then, then, you know, we've we got to get our education level up, right? And that's part of the reason for this uh, discussion, right? Um, part of the reason. All right. Behold my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one in whom my soul delights. I have put my spirit upon him, uh, he will bring forth justice to the nations. He will cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard. He will not, uh, I'm so sorry. He will not cry aloud or lift up his voice or make it heard in the street. A bruised reed he will not break and a faintly burning wick he will not quench. He will faithfully bring forth justice. He will not grow faint or be discouraged till he has established justice in the earth and the coastlands wait for his law. I'm so sorry. My whole prelude to this, I was actually thinking Isaiah 49, right? So anyway, here we see a, a servant. Maybe you could make it fit Israel. Uh, I think it fits Yeshua much, much better, okay? Um, why? Well, first of all, we're talking about some, some entity, be it an individual or a nation, who's righteous. And in the context of this, Israel is not the righteous nation. Right, it's, it's really, we've got too much going on, and we could go way back in Isaiah, way back earlier in Isaiah, and see all the judgments. All the it, it, Isaiah starts out very harsh. the The book starts out very harshly condemning Israel. Right, your sacrifices are nothing. Right, you're mixing it with with, with bloodshed and so forth. Um, Isaiah six, the call of Isaiah: Go to a nation that's not going to listen. Right? So in the context of the book, it's very difficult to make this fit Israel. Um, 
But the next one, it's even more clear. And this is the one I was referring to earlier about the debate I had with, with a rabbi. But, um, but let's read this and see. Listen to me, O coastlands, and give attention, you peoples from afar. The Lord called me from the womb, from the body of my mother, he named me. We could be talking about, so far at this point, could be about the Messiah, or it could be about God's creating and calling forth Israel. Okay, so, so, so far we don't know. He made my mouth like a sharp sword. <clears throat> In the shadow of his hand he hid me. He made me a polished arrow. In his quiver he hid me away, and he said to me, you are my servant Israel. It looks like it's about Israel because it says Israel here. My argument is going to be that can't be Israel, and we'll see why in just a little bit, but that the servant who's not Israel as a people is being called Israel because that servant takes up the role of Israel. Okay? Israel, you're called to be my witnesses. You're called to um, make my Torah glorious. You're not doing that Therefore, I'm going to call somebody else Israel, and they're going to take on that role, and they're going to bring it to completion. Okay? So let's read on, and I'll show you. I think it'll be pretty clear why it can't possibly literally be Israel. Uh, verse 4. But I said, okay, whoever is just being called Israel is now speaking. But I said... I have labored in vain. Okay, so somebody is being called who's got a, a difficult job ahead of them, something that might discourage them. I have spent my strength for nothing and vanity, yet surely my right is with the Lord and my recompense is with my God. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant. Okay, we've got that word servant here again. The Lord is speaking to this one that he called Israel. Uh, and, and servant to bring Jacob back to him. If this servant is Israel, how can Israel bring Israel back? You know what I'm saying? It's, so this has got to be another entity. This has got to be the Messiah. The Messiah is the one who calls Israel back. This is not Israel somehow calling Israel back. That doesn't make sense. And now the Lord said, he who formed me from the womb to be a servant, to bring Jacob back to him, that Israel might be gathered to him. That's one of Yeshua's roles, is to bring Israel back to him. Yes? Could be thought someone inside Israel is going to be doing that? Like yeah. That's how always, always, you know, Yeshua is. It's, right. Yeah, yeah definitely. Definitely. Okay, I just want to make sure. Yeah. Yes, sweetheart. Not to mention, um, there was a prophecy inside either Isaiah mm -hmm. uh, that uh, um, uh, the Messiah uses uh, is uh, to call the, um, the leaders of Israel hypocrites. The, um, oh. Uh, because uh, my point is that it can't uh, be Israel because they are hypocrites. So. Yeah, right. Now, now it is important... Um, that we understand this within the context of Isaiah's time and Isaiah's message, right? So we wouldn't say Israel is hypocrites, right? That'd be far too broad of a statement. Uh, and, and Israel has had wonderful, beautiful times of um, revival and doing the will of the Lord. And there, even when Israel is going astray, there's a remnant that remains righteous. So... Uh, so, Emily, you're right, but I would just say, let's not use that language, Israel is hypocrites. We would say pe some people within Israel are, are hypocrites, or Isaiah's message in this particular case is about Israel and their hypocrisy. Um, so, but, but we do need to limit it. All right, now, um, going back to verse 5. And now the Lord says, he who formed me from the womb to be his servant. We have a servant that's going to bring Jacob back. So that's proof right there. The servant's not always Israel. To bring Jacob back to him and that Israel might be gathered to him. For I am honored in the eyes of the Lord and my God has become my strength. He says, it is too light a thing that you should be my servant to raise up the tribes of Jacob and to bring back the preserved of Israel. I will make you as a light for the nations that my salvation may reach to the ends of of the earth, okay? What we see here is the bigger theme of God 
redeeming Israel, now being placed on the servant. It's the same theme. Sometimes we just hear about God doing it. And, and now we get to hear about the servant doing it. Right? Make sense? So it's, it's, it's the same context, the same thing. Israel, you are wayward. Israel, even though you're going to go through times of punishment, I'm going to redeem you. And now we see the servant's role in that. The servant's role is the redemption of Israel and it gets enlarged in the light of the nations. Okay? All right, now we get to Isaiah 53 a little bit. Isaiah 53, 11. Out of the anguish of his soul, he shall see and be satisfied. By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant. There we have the word servant again. Uh... By his knowledge shall the righteous one, my servant, make many to be accounted righteous, and he shall bear their iniquities. You, it, it doesn't go with the flow of Isaiah. I mean, look at all these, and, and I limited it, right? I could have, and this is just starting at chapter 41, right, going to chapter 54. I could have gone before and after that. I could have pulled more things out even within these chapters, the theme is overwhelmingly strong. Israel has fa failed. God will redeem. To then say, well, within Isaiah 53 uh, is something totally different. Israel's the righteous servant all of a sudden that redeems others totally misses the context that God is unilaterally redeeming and he's going to do, through, do so through his servant. Let me, um, well, let's, let's see, did I put this up here? Um, okay, yeah, so, uh, so here I wrap up some of those themes, okay? Isaiah exposes Israel's sin, but the servant of Isaiah 53 is without vi uh, violence or deceit, okay? Verse nine, this one suffers in innocence, Okay, I'm going to read 53, 9. And they made his grave with the wicked and with a rich man in his death, although he had done no violence and there was no deceit in his mouth. That's not the theme of Isaiah. Look how good Israel is suffering unjustly. How can you have chapter after chapter after chapter exposing Israel's waywardness and Israel's sin and then all of a sudden have a chapter where you say, oh, that must be Israel's suffering and innocence. Janelle? Um, okay. Sorry, I'm, I've just gotten confused by the pronouns in Isaiah 49. Yeah. It appears to be the suffering servant talking in this. Is that correct? Uh, yeah, yes. Okay, I just wanted to make sure. So, aka, as we would say, Yeshua is talking. Yes. Okay, just wanted to make sure I understood the pronouns correctly. Yes, you got it. Okay. Okay, so, Israel's not... Israel can't possibly be the righteous sufferer after having chapter after chapter after chapter of being denounced for their waywardness. And the theme is, I will redeem you. So it fits much better to see that this servant of the Lord is the one through whom God will do the redeeming of Israel. The, 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 there's no other chapter you can point to where you say, see, Israel redeems the nations. Israel saves the nations. The, it's always God does the redeeming. And so he does so through, through the Messiah, which our understanding of the full um, association of Father and Son and Spirit. So when the Messiah comes, he's the fully divine Messiah. And we believe, <coughs> we believe uh, seriously. Uh, Isaiah chapter 9, right? The one who's born. Wonderful counselor, mighty God, everlasting Father, Prince of Peace, right? These are incredible names to give a child who's born. And so, it's not like Messiah is something or someone other than God doing the redeeming. This is God doing the redeeming. Yes. Um, it, how does capitalization work in Hebrew? There isn't any. There isn't any. Mm -hmm. So when there's a capital servant, capital servant, lowercase servant, that's just an, an interpreter's. Yeah, that's a theological reflection. Okay. Yeah. I just want to make sure I yeah. understood that. Okay. Yeah. Okay. All right. So. 
So anyway, this righteous one who suffers on behalf of others has got to be something other than Israel because Israel's guilty, right? That's, it's a, if you read Isaiah closely, especially these chapters, you see it's a law case, right? It's, it's a, God has, it's like a courtroom scene. Sometimes it's God against Israel. Sometimes it's God against the nations. When it's God against the nations, Israel becomes a witness, some, some, sometimes inadvertently, right? Even if they're not being a good witness, they're still a witness. Do you see, O oh nations, what, I, what I've done with my people, my faithfulness to my people? Or Israel, we're, 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 in, a, we're in a courtroom, basically, right? And here's my proof, yeah. right? And so uh, within that context of God having a court. Uh, a, a, a lawsuit against Israel. We're not going to see, oh, you're you're innocent. You're, we're going to see you're guilty, but I'm still going to have mercy on you. Okay. Um, the righteous servant rescues both Israel and the nations, as we saw in forty nine six. How can Israel rescue Israel? Okay, so Israel can't be the righteous servant. Point three, the righteous servant suffers in innocence, but God promises that Israel will be blessed when innocent and only cursed when guilty. In other words, to see Israel as a righteous sufferer is anti-Torah. Say that one more time. To see Israel as suffering in innocence is anti-Torah because Torah promises if you are innocent, these are your blessings. If you are guilty, these are the curses. Okay? And, and we see that um, in Leviticus 26. I'm not going to read that, but you can write it down if you want. Leviticus 26, blessings and curses. Deuteronomy, blessings and curses. Okay? Uh, yes? But innocent people suffer, um, and, but, I mean, it says the guilty suffer and the innocent suffer. Right. But in... The, the righteous serpent suffers, literally. Yes. Yes. So you're saying Israel as a whole. Israel as a whole. Right. So God has a special covenant with Israel. Okay? We there's can't... different kinds of suffering. Like, there's a suffering that's due and there's suffering that's not due. Is that what basically we're saying? As in, no. Israel can't suffer for righteousness' sake because they were guilty. They can only suffer for due sake because they were guilty. Well, that, that, was, that was a point, but this is a different point. Okay. This point is, is God promises Israel that they won't suffer on any level. Um, doesn't mean that there might not be righteous ones here and there that suffer, but by and large, Israel will not suffer. Their crops won't suffer. There won't be miscarriages. You're, you're talking about Gibor and Gilal or whatever it's called. That's part of it, yeah. That's yeah. what you're talking about. Okay. Right. So Israel will not suffer if they follow God. Okay? It's a special covenant. It doesn't mean that you and I will never suffer if we follow God. Right? It doesn't mean that America, uh, if we follow God, everything's going to be perfect. It, 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 it's a special covenant with Israel. Mm -hmm. Does he mean suffering from his hand? Like, I won't cause you to suffer? Because there's still suffering of the fallen world that we all experience. I, what I would suggest is that you go because, back and read those chapters and, okay. and see. God promises protection. Right? God promises protection. Now, it, it, it's pretty encompassing. Right, those chapters of blessing and cursings are, are pretty encompassing, especially in an agrarian society. Okay, the, I'll have the rains, my cattle will always give birth, right? Uh, my enemies will be scattered before me. And that's the promise. And so with Israel, when you see suffering, it's a sign that something's wrong in their relationship with God. Right? We can't overly apply that to ourselves. Yeshua tells us we're, we're going to suffer. But this was the Mosaic Covenant. And so if we see Israel suffering in innocence because of the sins of others, and that's the non-Messianic Jewish line, 
that's that's their that's the point that they tried to make their argument. And God bless them. I please, um, you know, we can't have anything but a posture of love towards our people. You know, our people have been through so much, uh, and and this is not to lay fault or to be derogatory towards Israel, but it is to say they're they're wrong here, and they need to know they're wrong so they can see Messiah. If Israel is enduring terrible things. It's a sign that the covenant between God and Israel has somehow been broken. Torah makes that clear, right? If you follow me, these are your blessings. If you don't follow me, these are your curses. And, yeah? Sorry, so are you saying that that covenant is still in play and not the covenant? Like when, since after Yeshua died on the cross, are you, are they in that covenant, if they enter it or not enter it? Or are they still in the <coughs> covenant? That's a good question. Let me... Let me not answer that right now. Okay, sorry. That's, no, it's a, good, it's a very good question, uh, but I think it's going to take too much time to answer that. Okay. I do want to address it in the future, though, so, so keep that question in mind. Remind me of it. Well, okay. I'll write it in my notes. Good idea. <laughs> All right. Um, but during this time, this is before Yeshua came, right? So even, even if there's some transition there, um, it, doesn't, it doesn't apply uh, in the book of Isaiah. So, um, yeah, and not only that, one thing I didn't put up here, I don't think, yeah, one thing I didn't put up here is the idea that when Israel is, when God comes to Israel's rescue because of her tormentors, it's never a blessing to the nations. It's, it's always, um, let's see if I can... find this real quick. <clears throat> okay, yeah. Uh, chapter 41. This is God saying, I'm going to come to your rescue, Israel. Okay? Verse 14. 41, 14. Fear not, you worm Jacob, <coughs> you men of Israel. I am the one who helps you and to declares the Lord, your Redeemer is the Holy One of Israel. Behold, I make of you a threshing sledge, new sharp and having teeth. You shall thresh the mountains and crush them, and you shall make the hills like chaff. You shall winnow them, and the wind shall carry them away, and the tempest shall scatter them, and you shall rejoice in the Lord and the Holy One of Israel. You shall glory. So, so the theme here, and it happens in other places as well, is that when God comes to rescue Israel from her tormentors, the tormentors are scattered like chaff. Israel becomes a, 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 an instrument, a weapon against those. And so Israel's redemption is not the blessing of the nations, but the punishment of the nations. God rescuing Israel is the punishment of the nations. But we see something different, something unique in Isaiah 49 and 53. We see that somehow this one who suffers in innocence is, brings blessing to the nations. Right? All throughout the Bible we see this. We never see in the Bible, Israel, when I come to rescue you from those who torment you, I'm going to bless your tormentors. I don't think we ever see that. Israel, when I come to rescue you from your tormentors, your tormentors better look out. They're in trouble. But somehow some other figure comes and suffers in innocence, and, and God's vindication of that suffering servant somehow brings, brings blessing on Israel and the nations. It's a different scenario. God's doing something unique here. Make sense? Okay. Uh, now, the high status of the righteous servant, okay? Uh, don't need to read through all of this, right? God's spirit is upon him, Isaiah 42, verse 1. He establishes justice on the earth, verse 3. The coastlands wait for his Torah, verse 3, right? This is, this is a powerful, powerful figure. 
Isaiah 49, 6, he's a light to all the world. This is a phenomenal, powerful figure. 52, 13, he's high and lifted up. Now those words in Hebrew, uh, Ram and Nisa, okay? The meaning and, Ram, the Nisa, high and lifted up. In the book of Isaiah, we see this only declared of God. Okay, it happens two other times. Isaiah 6, 1, in the year that the king Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He was high and lifted up. Same words, Ram Venisa, sometimes a little different form depending on where they are in the sentence and their function in the sentence, but the same root words. Ram Venisa. Who's Ram Venisa? God, of course. Is Israel Ram Venisa? No. Is Isaiah Ram Venisa? No. Who's Ram Venisa? God is high and lifted up. In Isaiah 57, 15. <clears throat> For thus says the one who is Ram Venisa, high lifted up. Right? Talking about God, who inhabits eternity, whose name is holy. I dwell in the high and holy place, and also with him who is of a contrite and lowly spirit, to revive <coughs> the spirit of the lowly, and to revive the heart of the contrite God is Ram Venisa. But in Isaiah 52, 13, which really should be thought of as part of Isaiah 53, my servant shall act wisely, and he shall be Ram Venisa. Right? The servant is high and exalted, like God is high and exalted. It's pretty, it's pretty powerful stuff. And I think, again, we can go back and look at Isaiah chapter 9. He's El Gibor. He's God Almighty. Right? Not only that, but we see God saying things like, you know what? I'm going to bear my holy arm. No one else is going to redeem. I'm going to redeem. Well, if God says, I'm going to redeem, and then we see the servant redeeming, there's a unity there between God and the servant that's powerful. That's why this idea, uh, the idea of the full divinity of Yeshua that within God we have Father, Son, and Spirit. The reason that's so important is because the servant of God does what only God should do, receives worship and rulership that only God should receive. And if he is something other or someone other than God, then it's, it's idolatry, right? Yeah. Um, I think it's reflected in some of the parables that Yeshua spoke where it talks about him sending servants yeah. and then he sent his own son. Right. And, yeah. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah, in fact, that, that parable came to my mind. I, I forgot to include it, but you're, you're right. So, Because um, it shows God's, Yeshua's divinity. Shows his divinity, right. And it shows that the servant, Israel, needs a servant sent to her, mm -hmm. herself. Yeah. Right. All right, any other thoughts on this? All right. Uh, and I'm not going to read through these. <clears throat> but we also have the witness of the New Testament that applies uh, Isaiah 53 to Yeshua, okay? Matthew 8, 14 and 17, etc., right? So, um, and we have a variety of writers there, okay? Whoever wrote the book of Matthew, whether it's Matthew or not, John is a witness, Luke's a witness, Peter's a witness. Uh, we have Luke again, because Luke, Luke wrote the book of Acts. And then we have Paul, right? So we have Matthew, John, Luke, Peter, and Paul. We have five witnesses in the New Testament. Hey, this passage is about Yeshua, right? All right, now, spiritual lessons for us, and then uh, I'll open up for any comments or questions. Um, we, we need to understand this, how much the rescue of Israel and our own rescue is based on the Lord's work alone, you know? Right? And that kind of goes in with what I felt was feeling like the Lord was telling me earlier, you know? Like if you feel distant from the Lord, you haven't been living your life really devoted to him, but you want to change that here and now, it's changed. Why? Because it's based on the work of the Lord, not your own work. You just receive it. Right? So this powerfully underlines 
for Israel, for the world, for us individually. It's the work of the Lord that saves us. Number two, the witness of Israel, and therefore our witness, is in the world, is in the world seeing what God has done for us. Israel, you're my witnesses. How is Israel a witness? Because they're so good about getting the message out. They're the witness because the world can see in them the faithfulness of God. Look, he, he does punish their sins. He does forgive their sins. He does maintain his promises to Abraham and the people of, uh, of Jacob. That <clears throat> this land will be theirs. That he will send the Messiah, right? So it's in this um, passive kind of existence before God. By passive, I don't, I don't mean don't do anything. I'm not talking about you know, the nature of our work, but I'm saying in seeing that we are the receivers of God's faithfulness is in, that's what our witness is. My witness is not, I've done so good that I've gained God's favor and God's approval. My witness is he's forgiven my sins despite all I've done wrong, you know? This is my witness. What's that, Donna? As in supernatural uh, oh, it's you life. Yeah, and, and change, right, um, right, exactly. I'm not saying, so go smoke cigarettes now. Uh, you know, um, right, in that he, we have received a new heart, Ezekiel 36. We've received the spirit of God, right? And that needs to be evidenced. But still, in our evidencing it, it's not, look how hard I tried to overcame my, overcame my bad habits. You know, look at me, praise God, but look at me. It's, not, it's it, No, I used to love these things that were not of God, but he's changed my heart, he's changed my mind, right? We're transformed by beholding and abiding. Exactly, exactly, yes. Is it okay to give an example of that? Sure. Um, I used to, to like, I used to like anime, uh -huh. and uh, the most of you guys are wondering why I'm giving this example, but most anime is not godly. It's right. like you. It's very hard to find an anime that is clean. Right. So, and I used to like all the anime, but now I only like the ones that are clean and that have been approved of. Yeah. And but... I and I it took a while for me to realize this. Right. Well, the Lord changed your heart. It's a perfect example. Very good. All right. Uh, and then finally, and this is also important. While Israel maintains an important role as a witness to what God has done, our faith is not Israel-centric, but Messiah-centric. In other words, if we were to see Israel as the suffering servant, we would be finding our salvation, our, our, our faith, our, our spirituality in Israel. God loves Israel. This is not anti-Israel. God loves Israel. God has a plan for Israel, right? Yeshua says of Jerusalem that we're not going to see him again until they say, Baruch haba b'shem Adonai. Blessed is he who comes in the name of the Lord. Israel has an important part, a important component in God's plan and in God's heart. Right? Paul weeps over Israel. Yeshua weeps over Israel. We should be as well. We should be in love with Israel. But we are not defined. Our religious practice, our spiritual practice is not defined within Israel, but within the Messiah. And that's different. And, and, and I deal with this issue all the time, uh, unfortunately. Not, not with you guys, but uh, with, with people I converse with um, online and sometimes face to face, right? They define their practice within Israel. If Israel is doing this, I should be doing this. Well, maybe, maybe not, right? Ultimately, everything that you are defined in is, should be in Messiah. Messiah is the central figure of Isaiah, not Israel. Messiah is the suffering servant, not Israel. Messiah is the redeemer, not Israel. And so my faith is not in Israel, in her practices, in her faithfulness to God, which comes and goes, but it's in, in the Messiah. He alone is my redeemer and my rescuer. And that will change things on the ground. Right? That'll change some of the decisions I make. 
I used to pray daily from a traditional siddur, and I felt God's presence in it, right? But, but eventually, I got to the point where I couldn't anymore. Here's what would happen. I would start praying from the siddur, which is a traditional Jewish prayer book, and I would sense God's presence with me, and I would get like really spiritually excited to the point where I couldn't even stay focused on the page anymore, and I just had to put it down. And, and just worship the Lord and bow before him and sometimes even run around before him, right? Stuff I don't normally do in front of people, but I just... But eventually it started happening like sooner and sooner till, uh, till it got to the point where I couldn't even open the Siddur anymore. It's just, bam, I'm in the presence of God. I don't need the Siddur, right? I'm not saying the Siddur is necessarily bad. There are some things in it that are questionable, some beautiful things in it, but I don't need the Siddur. I'm just because, but but if I have this mindset of my faith is defined by Israel, then it's like no, I've got to do the siddur. This is what Jewish faith does. Jewish faith is in the siddur. Jewish prayer is in the siddur. But if I don't define it that way, I define it in Messiah. Then the siddur could be or not be a tool, depending on how the Spirit leads me. But in Messiah. That's how I'm defined. And it gives me the freedom then to be led by the Spirit. Do I accept this or not accept this for my prayer time today? And usually it's not, at least for myself, right? And so uh, your identity, my identity, our faith is not faith in Israel, but it's faith in, in the Messiah. It's defined and led by the Messiah and the Spirit of the Messiah. All right. Any thoughts or questions? See what happens when you ask a question, Daniel. So, <laughs> well, I, I appreciate the question. I really do. I hope uh, hope I didn't go on too long, but um, it, it's a good question.